Hello. Um, today I want to talk about a very important topic, people and their pets and the relationships that they have. Clearly, most people get pets because they love them and they want them to love them in return. However, this is not always the, the case. And I want to cover some important topics which can act as barriers to a, a healthy relationship, both from the owner's perspective, but also from uh, their pet's perspective. I'm going to focus on dogs, but what I say will apply to many pet species as well. Um, in order to do this, I'm going to address um, some common fallacies um, which are put out in a lot of popular media uh, in relation to relationships. And uh, I hope to conclude by, with some practical examples um, of how we can build healthy and happy relationships that work for both owner and pet. So my talk is divided into five sections. I'm going to talk briefly at the start about the place of dogs in our lives and our responsibilities towards them. Um, and a little bit about the history of those responsibilities. But our responsibilities go well beyond our legal obligations. And what I want to present is actually a moral framework which actually works for everybody. I'm going to talk about um, the emotional biases that can be induced um, by looking at dogs and our relationship with dogs because unfortunately um, there are a number of features in dogs that can affect the way that we think about them and whilst that generally can be very positive it can have uh, some negative consequences that I'll, I'll discuss but it's important to appreciate that people's relationship with their dogs is often a highly emotional one and so just rationalizing it and trying to explain to people what they should and shouldn't do may not work because um, people will be strongly driven by their emotions to follow those sorts of responses. I will then address the issue of um, social organisation in dogs by making uh, reference to some studies of free ranging dogs. Often people talk about wolves um, when they talk about um, dogs and, and assume that the two are the same. Well, I want to present some data, as I said, relating to dogs, not wolves, and I'll highlight some of the differences between um, the two species. And uh, from that, I will talk more about dominance and leadership, two concepts that are quite often misunderstood. And I want to explain what they mean from a scientific point of view and the implications of that um, for building healthy, happy relationships. And I'll take you through the logic of uh, of all of these processes so that we can lay out a framework for how to develop the right human dog relationship and when I say the right relationship I mean one that works for both the humans and dogs as well and hopefully that will all become quite um, uh, obvious if you've understood what's gone before. So dogs uh, feature in our lives in many different ways they can function as assistance animals or just companions. Um, we can use them in work uh, in various ways, whether you be a breeder or whether you be uh, working in security. We use them in research in a variety of ways, both to understand dogs better, but also um, to understand humans better as well. Um, they can provide enormous emotional support and um, we sometimes engage in a range of shared activities and the idea is that those activities like showing and agility work should be enjoyable for both. Clearly that's what most owners want or at least they and it's what they believe whether or not that is the case is a different issue. Uh, an important thing to appreciate is the importance of dogs in our lives is not a new phenomenon. If you look at this picture you'll see um, a renaissance painting of a couple with their dog and you know getting a, a picture painted was a very expensive endeavour and if you're going to include the dog in it that would indicate that the dog is a very important part of those people's lives. So we shouldn't think of it as, as I said something that is just a modern phenomenon. Dogs have been important to our lives for a very long time now. One of the common frameworks that is used for um, understanding our responsibilities towards dogs is the five freedoms. This 
um, was an idea that was developed in the 1960s, originally uh, out of concern for the well-being of farm animals. And you may well have heard of the five freedoms before. Um, and they talk about five freedoms that animals should have in order to avoid unnecessary suffering. Freedom from hunger or thirst, freedom from physical and thermal discomfort, freedom from pain, injury or disease, and freedom to express most normal um, behavior. And finally, freedom from fear and distress. Whilst these are obviously very good things to provide, they're not as simple as they might seem. So what do we mean by normal behavior? Where do we take our reference point for normal? What's normal for a dog out in a field may be very different from what's normal for a dog um, in the home. So the concept of normality is actually quite a difficult one. Um, equally, some behaviors associated with negative uh, states like uh, frustration, um, should they have the um, freedom to express those behaviors? I would say, yes, they should have the freedom to express those behaviors, but we don't want to actually induce them. So it actually becomes quite complicated to understand some of these ideas. Although the five freedoms have been incorporated into animal welfare legislation in very many countries. A major problem though with freedoms is that they represent rights and rights um, are statements of sort of moral claims and they can easily be abused if somebody doesn't agree with those rights. More recently, um, in the UK, we've moved away from the idea of animals having five freedoms in our welfare legislation and started to talk about responsibility for needs for those that actually care for these animals. And we have a series of codes of practice um, for the different species. I illustrate here the one for dogs. They're available for cats and a range of other species and they're freely available if you want to download them from um, the government website. A quote from uh, the dog document. An owner keeper must take such steps as are reasonable in all the circumstances to ensure that the needs of an animal for which you are responsible are met to the extent required by good practice as follows. Need for a suitable environment, need for a suitable diet, need to be housed with or apart from other animals, need to be able to exhibit normal behavior patterns, and need to be protected from pain, suffering, injury and disease. I think this uh, approach offers a number of important innovations beyond uh, the idea of freedoms. First of all, it puts the responsibility on the owner or keeper um, of the animal, rather than talking about the animal having certain rights in the form of freedoms. The second is it talks about um, the needs of an animal. It very much individualizes the care and recognizes that different animals in different circumstances may have different needs and that is a very important thing to appreciate. Every relationship is unique. So owners obviously love their animals and they want to care for them but do they actually provide necessarily what the animal wants? Um, unfortunately if we're just driven by love then our choices can be very emotional and that is not always a, a good thing. And so, unfortunately, the Beatles weren't right. Um, love is not all that you need. Um, we need a degree of rationality as well in order to accept our responsibility as an owner and in order to be able to provide for our dogs. An important thing to appreciate is that um, our behavior and our feelings are often driven by relatively simple processes and cues from the environment. An important one uh, that I want to focus on now is what's known as the baby schema. The baby schema is a range of features that actually, uh, when we see them, they, we find them attractive and they encourage a nurturing uh, response from us. These are the features that babies have that adults don't. So a relatively large head, a round face, high and protruding forehead, large eyes, a small nose and mouth are all features which if we see in an individual, they actually make us, um, they, we actually find them attractive and they make us want to care. 
for uh, that individual a little bit more. It has been suggested there are also some behavioural features as well that can also in encourage this sort of nurturing um, tendencies. So having short stubby limbs relative to body size and also perhaps moving in a more tottering sort of way like a toddler. Uh, we find these intrinsically attractive. Now this is all very well when this is directed towards our children. It encourages us not to abandon them and make sure that their needs are met. Um, but as I'll point out, it can produce certain problems. And it works very much at a subconscious level, as we'll see. If you look at these pictures, they've all been manipulated so that at least one of the features described previously um, has been accentuated. And these are represented in the columns labelled high. It may be difficult to tell exactly um, which ways the pictures have been manipulated, but each one has been. And when you present these images to people and say, well, which of these two do you prefer? People say, well, they look pretty much the same, but I'll pick that one. And their choices are not random. Uh, people consistently tend to choose the pictures that have the uh, baby schema features within them. And this is not something that is um, unique to uh, adults. It occurs in very young children. Indeed, children as young as three to six show this preference for the um, high baby schema features. And it's not just in relation to pictures of young, we show it in relation to adults as well. If you look at this picture, then um, you probably find it quite endearing. And this is a good illustration of it. Puppies with relatively big eyes, relatively short nose, high foreheads, we find very, very endearing. And it produces neurochemical differences in us. The hormone oxytocin is released when you look into the eyes of a puppy like this. And this is sometimes called the bonding um, hormone, although it's, its actual effects are much more complex, but it does cause social attraction amongst other things. So simply looking at an animal with those sorts of features um, induces this sort of bias in the way that we think about things. Um, and as I said, that can be um, a, a very positive thing because it means that we nurture for animals in certain situations when they need our help, when they're not so independent. Unfortunately, this has a darker side it can result in distorted perceptions. If we think about um, the features and how uh, endearing we find them, then we can potentially stop thinking very rationally and start acting more emotionally, even if it's not at a sort of high intensity as far as arousal goes, our behavior becomes much more emotional. Consider these two problems. I'm gonna take the one on the right first. If you Google um, baby and dog, you'll often see pictures like this. They'll often be short-nosed breeds of dogs in a bed with a baby. And many owners might think that this is very cute. Uh, oh, look how my dog and my baby, they love each other. Unfortunately, that's probably not um, the whole story. Many of these short-nosed breeds of dogs have difficulty in breathing and have to hold their head up in order to sleep. And so, as far as the dog is concerned, this baby is just a useful pillow that allows it to rest, quite apart from this being potentially a very dangerous thing to allow. I mentioned also that there may be certain behavioural features like a tottering gait, um, which uh, encourages nurturing as well. And it might be that actually we are inadvertently selecting not only for animals with these sort of baby features, shorter nose, bigger eyes, but also with gait abnormalities as well, which potentially are painful. Um, and if we think about it rationally, uh, we can identify that these are not good for the animal's welfare. But unfortunately, we often respond emotionally. We see these animals like this and we think that they're really cute and we ignore um, the welfare implications. So many features of dogs can actually um, make us want to care for them. And unfortunately, if we start um, providing care for them in a way that is largely driven by emotion um, rather than by careful consideration, 
then we can end up overfeeding the dogs, etc. And that is what's clear in this left hand picture here. There is an obesity epidemic in cats and dogs. And it's not that owners don't um, care for their uh, cats and dogs. It's the fact that as humans, we often use food as part of our social relations. Um, and so a way of showing care is to give food. That is not actually how dogs operate. That's not how they show care. And if we're in a caring frame of mind emotionally, because we think our dog is cute, then we're much more likely to end up overfeeding them, thinking that we're doing well, but not actually carefully reflecting on the implications of, of our actions. All this food can actually result in not only obesity and problems with the liver, um, but any dog of this sort of weight is going to have problems with its joints and um, be uncomfortable, which is going to reduce exercise and make the obesity worse. So there's a whole cycle of problems that go with overfeeding. So good intention is not adequate to protect the welfare of vulnerable individuals, whether they be humans or pets. Most owners act with good intention, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of suffering uh, in cats and dogs as a result. What we need is we do need some compassion. We need to recognize when our animals are suffering, etc. But we also need a degree of rationality in order to make sure that we don't get sucked into um, this tendency to operate emotionally. And that's the critical thing is uh, it shouldn't be that we are totally rational and cold about things. As I said, we have dogs to enjoy them, but we have to become aware of how our mono uh, emotions can be affected in a range of situations. We need to balance what is known um, against our own emotional feelings and recognize the biases that can operate, which can result in poor welfare.